order. Do I have a motion for executive session to certify personnel and legal matters? So moved to adopt, Jim. I have a motion by Ms. Johnson. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Bogle. <laughs> Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. We'll now go into executive session.
Do I have a motion to come out of executive session? So I move. Motion by Ms. Johnson. Do I have a second? Second. Have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. We will resume the record board meeting at 6 30.
help me in order for the demonstration going to school district one. We will now have our invocation by Reverend Eddie Brown, Saint John Baptist Church. Reverend Brown. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you have allowed us to be here on this day. We thank you, Lord God, for our teachers and our administrators on this day. Father, for their dedication and care, we give thanks and guide and, and guiding our children on their educational way. For teachers who inspire, that goes the extra mile, patiently nourishing our children with loving smile. We thank you, Lord, for wisdom and grace, blessing them abundantly in every place. For their tireless effort to help them grow and to impact their lives that they might know. We are grateful, Lord, for their tireless work that they do and continue to bless and take care of them and watch over them. Continue to bless those, those out throughout the year. Keep your angels in the camp around them and your loving hand around them. May you bless them with abundant grace, with thanksgiving and hearts, with expression of love. In Jesus' name, we continue to pray, O oh God, for our bus drivers, O oh Father God. We thank you, God, for our, our administrators and all of those who pray and pour them part in education, our children. Lord, just continue to bless them and keep them, O oh Father God. Guide them and, and let them be about doing what you have called them out to do. Continue to keep them in your perfect will. That everything they do and say, the work that you allow them to do, will be a blessing unto you. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. And for Christ's sake we pray, amen, amen, and amen. Confirmation and notice the media. Is there any members of the media present for this evening? No members appear to be present. There was no one here to speak uh, for the public forum. That being stated, we move into consent agenda. Do we have a motion for approval of the consent agenda? So I move for adoption of the consent agenda. Motion by Ms. Johnson. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Anderson. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carried. We'll now move to our uh, recognition. Oops, sorry, I skipped that. Recognition. So, if uh, we could have for swearing in of new trustees, Judge Lee Alford to come forward with uh, Miss Diane Howell for seat five. And Miss Howell, if you have any family members that would like to join you, you're swearing in, they can also come to the roll.
this house. And they're like, why are you doing that? <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Miss Howell was on the board for uh, two terms. So next we'll have our uh, school spotlight for Hunter Street Elementary School, Miss Jane Wallace Crump. Chairman Revels, members of the board, Superintendent Cox, thank you so much for inviting us here to spotlight Hunter Street. Um, I brought along my entourage back here because these are the ladies that are doing the work. I'm just in the driver's seat, sitting back, watching it all happen, creating the atmosphere. So our spotlight today, we have chosen the collaboration piece out of the student-centered learning framework. I have a hard time saying that, I have to slow down. Um, but you know, we, we as educators, we love to talk, but we need to make sure that that talk has purpose. And so that's what we've been focusing on so far this year. And um, I have with me three of my teachers. Let's see where you are. Jennifer Mauer teaches fourth grade language art. Abby Elliott teaches fourth grade math, science, and social studies. And then Samantha McCall teaches kindergarten. So we thought we would give you a view of what collaboration looks like on either end of the scale at Hunter Street. Um, we discovered very quickly when we were talking about collaboration, we sort of knew what that looked like with adults. But what does it look like with a kindergartner? And how, what are the skills that we need to bring forward and teach them so that they are able to collaborate within the classroom? So I'm going to be quiet <laughs> and let you see what that looks like. Um, and I um, forgot about Ms. Loss, Lindsay Lawson, the assistant principal, right here in my blind spot. <laughs> Sorry about that. But again, we're going to let you see how that looks at Hunter Street and the work that we began the very first day of school.
As you can see this face, I am a proud mama. <laughs> These three took off. I didn't tell them to do that. They took off with what we had talked about, and we are working hard. That word collaboration shows up in everything. I'm sure they're tired of hearing it by now, <laughs> but we're trying to put that into everything we do so that we work together to get there. And I know that this group is probably very familiar with collaboration, so I'm making my staff earn these, but I think you've probably already earned them. Yeah, this is a, 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 what am I trying to say, a pen <laughs> to go on the lanyard. It is called a cool collaborator. So by the end of the year, as we process through all the work that we're going to do, they will be able to use or earn the cool collaborator. But I'm going to collaborations is definitely um, went over into the social aspect. Well, I actually, yes, yesterday we had two girls at um, recess who had a conversation with one, one another, and so I encouraged them to use their voice, and I mediated or kind of stood back and watched them communicate with each other and solve their problem. And after one communicated with the other, it would show a misunderstanding. So it, it, it's working in all aspects. Tonight we get to recognize people that we don't normally get to recognize, and that's our board members. Um, congratulations to the following board members who reached a new level in the South Carolina School Boards Association Boardsmanship Institute. Mr. McSwain, if you'll come forward, he reached level one. And Mr. Childers, if you'll come forward, Mr. Childers reached level three. Established in 1982, the South Carolina School Boards Association Boardsmanship Institute offers a year-round training curriculum focused on leadership skills for board members on state and national educational issues. Congratulations, gentlemen. Next, I'll ask Ms. Rebecca Dover, who's the principal at Hickory Grove Sharon, to come forward. And I think we have the teacher, Deanna Ferry, if she'll come forward as well. Tonight, we are recognizing Caspian Russ. Caspian, are, will you come forward? All right. Caspian scored the highest obtainable score on the SC Ready Assessment during the spring of 2023. 
I said the highest and for a grade three math. Person being Western Will County Adult Programming. Uh, Dr. Lee Green, Sandra Johnson, Mr. Copeland, and Ms. Johnson. Good evening, everyone. Oh, Chairman Childers, board members, and Superintendent Cox. We would like to take this opportunity to update you on the Western York County Adult Learner Program housed at Floyd D. Johnson Technology Center. The Adult Learner Program was born out of the idea that a person's education is not only K through 12, it is a lifelong process. When Floyd D. Johnson was built in 2010, it was touted as a place where education is a collaborative effort between schools and the community. These ideas are the fabric of the beliefs and commitments of York School District 1. Ms. Spangler started the program several years ago with a grant from the United Way to offer Microsoft Office certification. Ms. Shelley Copeland expanded the program last school year to include classes that were of special interest to the community. At this time, Ms. Spangler and Ms. Copeland will describe the details of the Western York County Adult Learner Program. Can I make Correct, Dr. Green, I did not begin it alone by any means. We had collaboration between York Technical College um, and the United Way, and we're very excited that we've been able to do that for the last several years. Um, last year, uh, the program was offered second semester, and it has been every year. It's offered in the spring. Um, and we, uh, the grant funds provide for the tuition for the adults in the program in the amount of $1,499 per participant. Um, last year, we had 14 participants, two completed the Microsoft Office certification, and eight completed the Customer Service certification. Um, while those numbers are, are not where we want them to be, we continue to revise the program year after year to make it better and better. And we actually had a meeting today with new ideas for next year, and so we're excited about potentially what can happen futuristically, but we're also so excited for those 10 people who did achieve um, success in the program. So I'm going to turn this over to um, Shelly now who will give you other details of things that were offered. Okay. Uh, we offered a total of four classes provided by our very own um, culinary arts instructor, Chef Zimmerchek. Um, the first class was the art of charcuterie boards. Um, each participant took home um, a wood board and they created um, one of these masterpieces right here with different cheese and meats, um, honey, um, and they were able to take that home. That class was $55 per person. Then we also offered um, a cooking Italiano series. Um, you could choose to participate in the entire series, which um, included three cooking classes. And it was $150, or you could choose um, to participate in one or two classes at $55 per class. And each participant um, was able to take home a meal for four. Um, and so the first class was the Papadella pasta and making, creating sauces. Then you also had the Supa Toscana, which is also a favorite meal from um, Olive Garden. And it was their... <laughs> A lot of people really enjoyed that class, and they also made the salad dressings to um, place on the salads. Then we also, the last um, class in the Italian cooking series was the baked ziti with meat sauce, and they also made homemade breadsticks. Um, some of the feedback that we received from participants um, from the first class 
It was so much fun. Can't wait until next week. Um, another person said it was wonderful. Um, another person said we all really enjoy these classes and form friendships with our fellow cooks. Um, then we also partnered with Founders Federal Credit Union, and they provided us two free wonderful workshops for the community. Um, first time home buyers workshop, um, and then that class participants learn how learned about the mortgage process, the types of mortgages, how to negotiate a deal. In the budgeting workshop, participants learn how to create a budget and how to stick to it. And some of the feedback we received was it was very informative, made me reevaluate my spending habits, and learn how to prepare for making large purchase, purchases. And we have already scheduled um, three upcoming workshops um, in collaboration with founders, the budgeting on October the 5th, first time home buyers on November the 7th, um, and then new this year, we're adding legacy planning so people can learn about estate planning, learn about wills, and that's December the 7th. These classes are all free to the community, and um, we are also planning to offer a baking class. Um, the date is to be determined somewhere around the holidays. I uh, would like to make sure that we provide a low cost and have, you know, cater it to families to be able to come in and, and bake maybe Christmas cookies or gingerbread. All right. And we look forward to expanding the program. Any questions? Good evening again. So as you are aware of, we, we have a um, utility line worker program and, and ensure, in an effort to ensure that all of our students graduate college and career ready, we feel as though it is utmost important that we offer industry credentials um, that will benefit students as they pursue their choosing career path. One of the industry credentials that is essential is the, to our utility line worker program is the commercial driver's license. Through conversations with industry professionals, it was determined that the commercial driver's license is, is an almost necessity for individuals entering into the utility industry. Through a partnership with York School District 1, Clover School District, State Department of Education Transportation Department, and York Technical College, we are able to offer CDL to our students. The first cohort of students participating in the CDL training program began in May of 2023, which was this past spring semester. Students participating in this program received two weeks of classroom instruction from a State Department of Education Transportation uh, trainer. Once students turned 18, they began, began the permit testing process. Once they completed the permit proce testing process, students began the hiding the wheel training. After the behind the wheel training, students took the final test to obtain their full class B CDL, which is a, a, a step below the class A CDL, which will give them the opportunity to pull a trailer or, or equipment for the utility company. The following video benefits the, uh, shows the benefits of obtaining a CDL and with some student, student testimonies. Thank you. 
sets up the course. But now I'm going through the school, it's about four grand just to see the girls. My classmates and us, we have the one that's better than them, and so it's been crazy how you can tag those out. <laughs> that is that is pretty crazy. <laughs> but as you can say, I, I can't help but smile when I talk about all of our programs. Um, but as you can tell from our video, uh, the CDL component of, of our line worker program is a tremendous added benefit to the program for uh, from last year moving forward. Um, it sets, uh, sets students apart. It sets them up for success after, for life after high school. And it is a 4000 to even, even upwards of $5,000 value that students or their prospective employers would have to, to foot the bill for um, if they didn't have it. But they leave high school with a CDL in hand, uh, making them more marketable to employers um, as they apply for jobs. And it gives them a competitive advantage in the field. Um, and as he pointed out, it's icing on the cake. For an already incredible program, um, it is icing on the cake. Um, this CDL component fits perfectly into our mission of career readiness uh, for all students at FDJ. What better, better industry credential than a CDL in hand, as I mentioned, uh, for a future line worker? As a side note, we also plan to offer OSHA 10, uh, which many of you know is a very valuable credential as well that never expires, I learned today. Uh, so I'm still, still learning after six years in this role. Uh, and, a, and a final benefit um, that was pointed out by our instructor is that our students, when they have this in hand, they'll be able to give back to their community. They can drive for field trips. They can drive for athletic teams. Um, and, and I know some of y'all will enjoy that in the back. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. So we've we got a new crop of those coming for you. All right. So just to give you a snapshot of our spring students, we have three students with their full CDL. Uh, four students with permits in hand, and two students currently in the permitting process. And to give you some background on that, um, 18 is kind of the magic number for, for age for a CDL. I've learned so much about this process, y'all. It's amazing. Um, so students can complete the coursework and their physical and their drug test prior to turning 18. And once they turn 18, they can go to the DMV to test, to test for their permit, which is four Four different tests, general knowledge, air brakes, passenger vehicle, and school bus. And they must take and pass all before their permit can be issued. I am told that it is extremely rare for any person, young or old, to go and take and pass all four in any one sitting on the first, first go round. Um, for that reason, it takes multiple trips to the DMV for most folks to get the permit, which brings me to the most impressive thing uh, of this, this whole thing for me is that our State Department instructor goes with them to every visit to the DMV, one-on-one, -on -one, sits with them, coaches them through it. I mean, do y'all want to go sit at the DMV four different times? Time, <laughs> times 12 kids. Um, so, so that is impressive, the, uh, the dedication to that. So as I mentioned, they, uh, they are, once they have the permit in hand, they begin the behind-the-wheel training with our local York and Clover instructor, um, and then they can test for their full, full license. Um, so our kind of next steps, um, so this year in order to better accommodate students turning 18 throughout the school year, we started offering the coursework work component of the process on Fridays during class time as opposed to after York Tech classes ended in May last year. Um, so our utility line worker classes don't meet on Friday, so we decided to capitalize on that time and we brought them back in on Friday, so they're, they're doing the coursework component during class time on Fridays now. Uh, this gives us more of a staggered start for our 12 line worker students, and we're not packing everything into the month of May and into the summer. So classwork began last week, last Friday, September the 8th, and will continue throughout the fall semester. And once students complete the coursework and turn 18, again, the process will repeat itself, and they'll continue to go to the DMV with, with, uh, with our students this year to get their permits um, and begin the, on the on behind-the-wheel training once that's all completed. Uh, depending upon the availability of instructors, we also want to expand this program. Uh, we would like to include programs such as firefighting, welding, automotive, uh, ROTC, and, and others. Um, so on behalf of the entire staff of FDJ, we want to thank you guys for encouraging career readiness and supporting us in that mission that, that we, we take so seriously every single day.
Thank you. Any questions for us? We don't tell our story, somebody else will. So, <laughs> so that is our that is our goal. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, there is a twelve. It is capped at twelve, and we share that program with Clover. So depending upon interest levels and things of that nature, um, we it is capped at twelve for safety. So we had to have an application process starting last year. We, we did an application for students, um, just kind of gauging interest of, you know, do they want to do this just because it looks cool or is this a career path? Uh, so, we, and, and a lot of it depends on, you know, the, the number of seats Clover needs as well. Uh, this year we have the majority of the seats, so that's, that's a good thing. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got you. Yeah, we got you. We got you. They're, they are unicorns, as we've been told, yes. so, and we've and we've learned. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next, we'll have the uh, Summer Camp Report. Uh, Kevin Queen, Director of the Camp Association. Mr. Queen. Good evening, Superintendent Cox and um, Chairman Childers and school board members. Uh, York School District 1 had the privilege of partnering with the City of York for Summerfest 2023. We had over 115 York Comprehensive High School student volunteers who served, including uh, members from our course, our ROTC, athletics clubs, and other individual members of the senior class. York School District 1 was a silver sponsor uh, this year, which allowed us a tent on Main Street, uh, where we had 31 employees uh, who distributed booklets throughout the day. The booklets highlight our schools, uh, our departments, and, and the many programs that we offer. We also gave out over 3,000 fans, which were distributed to the community that um, shared our district logo and also our social media sites. And, of course, with the heat, those, those fans were, uh, were gone quickly and, uh, and, and good. Um, the partnership allowed... Uh, Um, the partnership allowed our school district to provide, uh, again this year, a, a, a school bus shuttle from York Middle School and from York Comprehensive High School. Uh, we transported that day 567 folks uh, back and forth um, from downtown back to, to middle school and high school. As I mentioned earlier, we uh, were a silver sponsor, so due to that, the district um, was able uh, to showcase uh, banners uh, with our logo on it. Uh, one banner was placed at the kids zone. Uh, the other uh, was placed at the uh, shuttle sites uh, where people uh, could recognize that we were offering that and know, know where to go. And if you, uh, if you attended Summerfest, you can relate to these pictures. Uh, it was indeed hot. Um, but I know that I speak for all of us when I, I say that we um, truly appreciate the privilege to partner with the City of York uh, as we serve our community and represent our school district. Um, I also must tell you that we um, have learned that from our participation in Summerfest, we had an applicant for a school bus driver uh, who we've now recommended to hire. Uh, and also, I learned today that Ms. Bolin, and I'm going to let her share the good news, if, if you would. Our math teacher that's on the agenda tonight is going to begin working in the Joint Middle School math department. So I hired a Dr. Mohammed Khan to stop to see us and do some research conversation with him. And pass the report then. And <laughs> so I think uh, if you approve him tonight, he'll be at the middle school. 
Very excited about that. So a lot of benefits. Absolutely, a lot, a lot of benefits from participating and and being a partner with the City of York Summerfest. But those were two two big highlights as well. So any questions about Summerfest that I can answer for you? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have athletic update. This is Chad Crawford, Director of Student Services. Coach Joy Moore will talk about the high school athletic director. And Coach Paula Blackwell will administer our program. Well, good evening, uh, Chairman Childers, Superintendent Cox, and Board of Trustees. Tonight, it's my pleasure to give you an update on our school athletic programs. Uh, joining me tonight is Mr. Joey Moore and our high school athletic director and Paula Blackwell, our middle school athletic director. Uh, Mrs. Blackwell is going to start off uh, with a review of our middle school program. So if we can move up, there we go. Okay, good evening. Uh, the picture, as you can tell, I know everybody sees this picture, but all three of those young ladies placed. The one was just a little sad that she didn't win first, so <laughs> she's okay, but... Um, I'll start with our numbers, football, 7th and 8th grade. Now, this is last year's numbers, but we maintained, I checked today, and I think we're at 99 this year, uh, football. Uh, volleyball, this is last year's 24. This year, we're at 26. Of course, wrestling, we won't know yet. Uh, last year's 42. Cheerleading uh, was 12 last year. We've grown this year. We're at 20. And, of course, boys basketball, and it says seventh and eighth. Those are two separate teams, though. You know, it's 25 total. Girls basketball, same, seventh and eighth, two separate, 22 young ladies. Baseball, we have 18. Softball was 13. Boys and girls track, as you can see, the army of 67, and it's usually 67. Um, but, yeah, we – Really try to include as many students as we can, get them to try, just try things. You know, you may not want to do it after one year, or maybe you'll do it a few years and not do it in high school, but just try to, you know, throw it out there to them. But Miss Valerino does a great job. Mr. Cunningham, Miss Mondo kind of jumping in and helping and encouraging athletics and trying to get everybody involved. Any questions, middle school? Welcome back, Ms. Howell. <laughs> uh, for the high school, uh, you see these numbers again last year. Uh, for football, you got three levels of teams there, ninth grade, JV, varsity, about 152. It's about, we're a little bit up this year, a little more than that. Across the country, 28. About normal. Girls golf, six. I think we have five out this year. Um, girls tennis, 16. We're up to about 22, I think, on this year's team. Uh, volleyball, two squads there with 24. That's normal. Uh, and swimming, we got 26 this year. Competitive cheer, 45 is about uh, what we run on there as well. So in the fall, about, as you see, close to 300 kids participating. Uh, the winter sports for us, basketball and, and wrestling. You see the breakdown there, JV team for boys was a little small there. Uh, this year we'll have the ninth grade team and the JV boys team and the boys varsity team. So our numbers for uh, all indications of the preseason and the offseason work, all indications we'll have those numbers will be up uh, this year for basketball for boys. Girls, uh, 14 on the varsity, uh, excuse me, 14 JV and 12 on the varsity. That's about the norm. 
and then wrestling, 38. A uh, brand new wrestling coach just got on board last week. Uh, we'll see what interest in wrestling is, if it's going to go up or down. You never know with the coaching change sometimes, but 38 was a good number. Um, in the springtime, cross country, that's from the other slide. That's actually in the fall. We covered that one. Boys golf, about six. We, we, we usually run six or seven kids, boys on the golf team. Uh, baseball, 30 with two teams there. It's 15 apiece. Uh, you see the soccer numbers for boys, 42 girls, 24. Again, new girls soccer coach. Seems to be a lot of new interest in soccer during the summer workouts and right now during our open season workouts. Um, we may surpass that number for girls this year. Hopefully we do. Softball, 28 for two teams is about normal. Boys tennis, we that was a little low last year. Hopefully we'll be pushing maybe up to close to 20 this year in the spring. And then track and field is everybody's favorite. You see those numbers are always high. Um, you know, there's 15 different events or something for somebody to do in track and field. So uh, about 90 kids last year. So total of 600 kids. Uh, that's, you know, a little less than half our student body involved in something athletically. We think that's pretty strong. And speaking about teams, uh, it, uh, we talked about this last year, that boys volleyball is something that's uh, uh, something we may add in future. There was an interest poll that was conducted this past spring. 15 seasons, they were the favorite one wrestler. Uh, and we're looking at another poll uh, to explore that possibility to come up this year and it, with hopes of possibly adding volleyball uh, in the fall. Uh, and of course, new to our team, uh, probably one of the hardest jobs and probably one of the most rewarding jobs is coaching. Uh, I did it for many years and it's wonderful and we're so happy to have these new people on, bo on board. Our new varsity coaches for 23-24, Courtney Furlong, Furlong. Volleyball, Thomas Douglas, uh, boys basketball, Daniel Hayden, girls soccer, Anthony McFadden, cross country, Matt Green, Glendale girls golf, and then Casey Thomason, competitive cheer, and Kip Charles is our new wrestling coach. Uh, as far as what's on the horizon, um, right around the corner at the 45-day count, as soon as we finish this nine weeks, every school in the state has to report their numbers uh, because it's realignment year. Uh, of course, that means the high school league will take those numbers once they're certified, and then they'll have the, the difficult task of breaking all the high schools into classifications and then into regions. Uh, I don't envy that task. We all complain about it every year when it's finished, but nobody wants to do it uh, because it is a tremendous struggle if you think geographically, how are you going to put these 3A, 4A, 5A schools close enough to travel and get even numbers. And somebody always ends up disappointed. Uh, from all indications that I've looked at and talking to other ADs and other schools, I think we're safe to remain as a 4A school. Uh, it's not 100% guaranteed, but uh, our numbers have not shown a tremendous jump from two years ago uh, when the realignment was done. So I anticipate us again being in the 4A classification. However, some of the schools we play now in 4A in our region, I anticipate them probably going up. You know, that, that Catawba Ridge area, Indian Land area, very likely they could go to 5A, and then that's going to push our region. We're going to lose two teams, and unfortunately, the only way you can find them is probably going south to, to Columbia, which increases our travel again, traveling down there to play region games in the middle of the week. But that's, that's what you get. So that's what's, what's coming up.
Good evening. It is just me tonight. <laughs> no, it's perfectly okay. Um, so, good evening, Chairman Childers, members of the board, Superintendent Cox. I am delighted to be able to share with you tonight an update on our collaboration days for this school year. We do have two of those on our school calendar. Our first one is coming up next week on September the 20th, and our second one will be on Wednesday, November the 8th. As we are continuing our work towards becoming a learning organization and building capacity and leadership at every level of our organization, all of the plans for professional collaboration days for this school year have been planned at the school level by our leadership teams. <clears throat> As principals and school admin teams prepare for collaboration days, each is ensuring that professional development and learning opportunities support our strategic change agenda and they are focused on one or more of the strategies that are included within our goals of the strategic change agenda. <clears throat> Principals and their school administrative teams are also planning collaborative day learning opportunities in an effort to support our York School District 1 student-centered teaching and learning framework. Specifically, the instructional and domain area that each principal has already chosen and shared with their school faculty on their focus and goal for this school year. Our elementary schools have planned the following sessions. We will have approximately 80 of our elementary staff members uh, participating in their letters training. Um, our elementary principals and teams have planned sessions with our instructional technology integration specialist to be able to support our teachers with two of our instructional tools, which are Exact Path and Mastery Connect. And then schools that are focusing on collaborative practices and um, designing small group sessions will have sessions within their buildings to focus on those two aspects of our teaching and learning framework. At the secondary level, school principals and teams have planned a mini conference that will be focused on teachers facilitating and sharing effective instructional strategies and practices. Teachers will have a choice to attend two of the session offerings and be provided time to collaborate with peers based on the information shared in these sessions. Our technology center has planned to begin exploring connections between current subjects and program performance skills and competency indicators. This work will be facilitated by Dr. Green and Ms. Shannon Clinton. We are very thankful for the board's support of the time provided for our administrators, teachers, and staff to collaborate around teaching and learning strategies focused on the work of our strategic change agenda and more importantly, our students. So thank you. If you have any questions about collaboration day, I will try to answer them. all know that the teachers in there that really work tougher and when we're able to get them dedicated time set aside to work and to collaborate with one another so that we're not taking it all in it is truly beneficial and we appreciate y'all continued support of allowing this to happen whatever you say so i'm gonna i'm gonna remain up here for one more time <laughs> I'm still going to stay. I'll just wait. <laughs> okay. Now I'm going to provide you with our GT update. Um, so I've been doing this. This is, makes my third time on my update. So we're going to kind of talk numbers today, but I wanted to begin by just reminding you of our GT goal within our district, and that is to maximize the potential of gifted and talented students by providing them with programs and services that match their unique characteristics and needs. 
And then just a reminder, this is a lot on slide, but in our district, for students to qualify for GT or what we call merit within our district, um, if they rank in the 96th national percentile um, for their composite aptitude test, then they are an automatic qualifier, okay? And that would have to be on their COGAT or on their Naglieri, which we began that again. We put that in last year. <clears throat> if they receive credit for two of the three dimensions, then they're eligible for placement. So dimension B would be our MAP scores, our SC Ready, and our Iowa testing. And then dimension C is when we give them a performance task. Um, also, whenever you get up into sixth grade and above, that dimension C also becomes a grade point average of 3.75 on their core subjects. <clears throat> when I was with you in the spring, we talked about <clears throat> our performance task assessment and our scores coming back. So I wanted to update everybody on that and newly qualified for that testing, we had 31 second graders and 78 third through eighth graders. And then this slide is me trying to show you how we are increasing our GT students in our district. So last August, when I was with you, we had 543. Today, 682. So we have increased by 139 more students with what we're doing in our district. And testing season is upon us again. So that begins in October, and we are now starting the referral process so parents can refer and schools can refer. So all of our second graders are going to be tested, and then third through sixth grade students who are referred either by their school or by their uh, parent will be tested beginning in October. Then we also have artistically talented <clears throat> students, and so we work with Winthrop University with their STARTS summer program. That's for students in grades six through eight. Um, this past summer, it was uh, June the 5th through June the 23rd. Those students go and they do art, voice, instrument, dance, and theater. This past summer, we had 45 students participate in that program, and 33 of those students are automatically eligible to per uh, participate again this summer. And then starting in November, we're gonna begin auditions to fill those remaining spaces that we have available for that program. Anybody have any questions? I will try my best to answer them or I'll call on my counterpart. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Good evening. That's okay. How are y'all this evening? Hope okay, everybody's good. Um, I won't take up much of your time. We're going to do a little bit of compliance stuff here. Uh, we're going to talk about E-Rate and the Children's Internet Protection Act. Uh, we'll start off with a little bit of information about what E-Rate is. Um, E-Rate is a federally funded monies for schools, public and private, and uh, libraries to receive money to assist them with their data connection, internet connection, anything we're going to talk to the internet. Uh, this is ran by the FCC and oversaw by the USAC um, Commission. Sorry, I'll go back to that. And it allows us to do quite a bit for a very reduced rate, and I'll go through that in just a minute. E-rate is split into two categories. Uh, we have category one, you can think of that as Internet service. Anything that goes outside of the building is considered category one data. Uh, category two is all our internal connections. Um, category one is actually for us handled at the state level, so we really don't have to involve ourselves in that. We just pay our per percentage and move on. Category two, we have to do a lot more investigative and a lot more paperwork to get those fundings to come through. But category one is unfortunately helped by the state. Uh, when we talk funding, funding is based off of National School Lunch Program. Uh, if you'll see the highlighted line there in yellow, we fall in that seven, the 50 to 74% uh, fall in the lunch program. So we get an 80% discount. 
on all of our data circuits and network infrastructure. That's enormous savings. Uh, school districts already get a good discount as we are. Uh, so when we look at the price of this, uh, just an example, as we go to some of our projects that we've done, one school of switch is about $100,000, um, and that is this one school. Uh, we pay right around that $20,000 mark for that. Uh, there's no way we can continue to run this network over and over without these funds. So that is why we go through this process yearly is to stay in compliance. Um, but we have done multiple switch switch projects throughout the district. We've replaced all of our wireless networking through E-rate funding. We have upgraded a bunch of cables in the district and we do all of our moves as and changes. If someone wants to move a computer to the back of the room and they need another data connection, that's paid through 80% through E-rate funding. So now what is CIPA? Well, federal government decided, well, they gave us all this money to do something and this was late 90s when all of this started. Well, about 2000, they said, we probably ought to put a rule behind it. So they came out with a very vague rule. Uh, school districts and public libraries will do their very best to try to keep children from harmful uh, content from the Internet. Um, that was very vague. There was no guidance. That was really the whole law. You'll try the best you can. In 2011, they amended that. It didn't go much further than the original, but there's two lines in here that we have to abide by. You'll see up at the very top, line one, uh, we must in internet security policies for monitoring of online activities for minors. Uh, we actually do that for everyone in the district because it's a whole lot easier now. Um, step two was educating our children on how to engage online. Social media, cyberbullying, uh, hacking, things like that. Uh, that was fairly easy because we just wrote up a document that is now in our handbook and it's a form that parents need to sign every year as the children come in. So the education portion was very uh, cut and dry. The second part of it takes a little bit more on the back end, right? Uh, it's a little more work on my end. Um, but we use four separate systems to do this compliance. Uh, we use a Palo Alto firewall, which allows us to block traffic internal and outbound. Um, it does some web filtering. Uh, we use LineWise, which does our heavy lifting web filtering. This piece of software allows us to, now that we're one-to-one -one and children take their devices home, we can filter them at home through this device. Uh, so they're getting the same filtering as they do when they walk in our building. Uh, so parents don't have to worry about them going to those malicious sites when they're at home. Um, LineWise is great. If you look down at the very bottom, it ties directly into Gaggle. Gaggle is a phenomenal, and uh, Mr. Carper uses it quite often. Um, it monitors everything the children do online. That includes writing a Word document. Anything that has something in it, they are looking at it. Um, and it ties directly into LineWise, which is, allows us to see what our students are searching on the Internet. So if you're seeing some malicious things coming from a child over and over, self-harm, those type things, we can reach out to those students and try to engage them before something actually happens, uh, which is a really nice feature. Uh, the last piece of equipment we use is actually a state-funded product. It's all software-driven. It lives in the cloud. And we use this to block things. There are certain things in the world that we can't block because they're wrapped in a encrypted message, right? So we have to rely on something external to here to just block the traffic totally. And we use that Cisco umbrella product that is paid for by the state. Um, that makes us 100% compliant with CIPA, and we are still able to get our funding for E-rate so we can afford to continue to do the cool things with the wireless and all of our networking. Any questions for me on CIPA? Uh, Era, I just told you everything I know about those two, so if you ask me anything else, I don't know. But, uh, anything about technology? Good. And we got it working about three minutes before you walk it in. That's right. That's what technology does. Well, we appreciate y'all. More than that. Thank you. Thank y'all.
Good evening, board members. Um, my first item is an action item regarding unused sick leave. Um, per policy GCC, GDC, uh, the district may compensate employees for unused leave days that are in excess of the 90 days cumulative leave ballots as of June 30th. Um, so as a part of our 23-24 budget process, you, the board voted to compensate our employees with days over 90 at a fourth of their daily rate. You can see we have 60 employees who had um, sick leave in excess of the 90 days at June 30th. We'll compensate those employees in December of this year, and you can see the total cost is a little over $41,000. And so I ask for your approval. Is there a motion added to my portion to recommend compensation of employees who have been employed by the board at the rate of pay? Motion by Mr. Noble, second by Mr. Johnson. Do you need a second? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you. The next is policy GC, GCCAC, GDCC, paid parental leave, and I ask for your approval for first reading. Is there a motion? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Abbott. We'll now turn it over to Office of Human Resources and Jennifer Bowling. Good evening. I have three action items and one information item for you tonight. The first action item is for some new classified positions. These are two assistant positions that we're requesting, one at Jefferson Elementary and one at the high school. The one at Jefferson would be located in a multi-level two classroom to assist with some behavior um, needs that are in that classroom. Um, just to give a little bit of information of what multi-level two is stated there, a student has to have more than two disabilities and the student cannot be accommodated in a special education program designed for one of those disabilities alone. It has to be to, um, for both of those disabilities that they are qualified for. And it has to be within a self-contained classroom. And then the one at the high school is to help us with, um, currently we have a couple of teachers that are virtual special ed teachers that are coming through our hiring agency that we had to use this year. And it's called Blaze Work Staffing. And this is to help us to um, get the students located to where they need to be to get the virtual special ed program. A lot of times it's small group, it might be a one-on-one -on -one session and making sure the organization of getting children where they need to be and you know how high school kids can be and <laughs> making sure we get them to where they need to be at, and online on their Chromebook with the teacher and making sure those things are and taking place. So that is my action item for tonight, one of them. All right, and our second action item are certified resignations and release of contracts for 23-24 school year. All right, and our next action item is certified recommendations for 2023-2024 school year. We have a motion and it's recommended by Mr. Noble. I move that as I am a certified recommendation for 23-24. Motion by Ms. Johnson. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Anderson. Any discussion? Is there executive session? Any need for discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 And our last item is just an information item there, and it's a certified retirement. That's it.
Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. talk about IDEA Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. We do that pretty in depth, it's a pretty good little session here. And a lot of the sessions talk about liabilities of boards, parental bill of rights movement, and different things that we may actually come up every year. Uh, what that really is and how we phrase it is going to the Texas Teachers Right of Education Act. We talk about uh, discipline, personnel, special education. Uh, we did have a good one on constitutional law discipline. Uh, we did talk about, of course, the bill that passed last year, which most of us have talked about because it's been a really good thing that got out there. In discussions, we talked about uh, a couple of things come back, obviously, the ANSI thing got to us. Uh, I didn't get that to us. Um, South Carolina High School League discussion was going around the state with the Department of Schools and whatnot. I think uh, um, Coach Moore mentioned that. Played to, so that was a discussion item. Uh, last item we did talk about on Sunday morning, part of was Gavin's Law with uh, Representative Guppy, you know, that was named after his son for sex extortion, incidents of sex extortion. That is a requirement of, of the state now, so we will have to figure out moving forward what we do with the district of it in the school district about entertaining and participating in that and uh, have the court assign a seat to that. So that's a general overall, but it was a good topic. Uh, it was pretty engaging. The folks that were there were not late to the whole round table discussion, so it, it was a good one. I don't know if anybody had any questions on that, but I think that's pretty much it. May I add a vote for Mr. Johnson? Yes, ma'am. We did learn last week from the EDA when we got it from the State Department on how to give educators credits on that. This is, will be the first time that we've done that, and that's happening this spring. So, 
October 5th and 6th are our parent teacher conferences. October 6th, we will have Faith with Students. Um, we do have intercession week that begins the week of October the 9th. That 9th is our professional development day, uh, and I would encourage anyone whose schedule allows for you to come and join us. We'll have two big professional development sessions going on. At the high school, we'll be having our Connect to Ed conference. That conference is put on by our teacher forum. It's professional learning by teachers for teachers. We're really excited about that. Um, simultaneously, at the middle school, we will be hosting the Jesus Specialist Conference for all of the older English teachers. Um, so lots of opportunities to be there. Uh, I'll hold on to other dates if I don't get an opportunity to come at a later date. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. So much. It's, it's, it's a group we're going to spend a day on. Can we go to the high school and spend a day with them? Absolutely. And then We're setting it up, if you would think of it like your law conference or your annual conference, it's set up conference format and it's going to be a huge four days of activities. There will be a couple of outside vendors, um, not selling things, but educational purposes. We've brought in some financial advisors that will be talking particularly to our first year teachers about the importance of saving your time, um, banking your days to have unattended events in your life, uh, retirement set up, October 10th, we, we will be here and we'll have some good food for you. That's right. We can't wait for that. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> That's all I have for you this evening. Anybody else have any items? Seeing none, is there a need for executive session? No apparent need for executive session. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved for adjournment. Motion by Ms. Johnson. Second by Mr. Henderson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. We are adjourned. Thanks to everyone for coming.